I've just been asked to talk about viruses in general. You know, I've tried to keep this uh, not too scientific y, so I'll give you uh, some science background to it, but I was more geared toward general population. Uh, I want to treat this more like a seminar, not really a lecture. So, really, if, if you want to talk more about things or if something else pops in your head, we can go on tangents. We have over an hour to be in here. I only have about 30 slides or so, so we should have plenty of time. So please feel free to stop me, raise your hand, ask any questions you want, and I'm just going to kind of go through my slides and, and see how it goes again. So I'm a molecular biologist in the Department of Biology here, and uh, I'm not a virologist, but I have taught it within my classes before. So some of this background uh, I'm pretty uh, aware of. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what is a virus, so we'll define it, we'll talk about uh, the structure of many viruses. I'll be focusing on animal viruses mainly, so, since we're animals, but I'll mention a few plant viruses as well. Talk about how and what do they infect, so as it turns out they're pretty specific for what they do. How they cause disease, so that's very important to us. So, uh, and at, at the end basically we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how to treat it. And in addition to HIV, I will also discuss some of the other viruses that have been in the news lately, because there have been a few. And so, uh, even though it's just part of the uh, associated events with the uh, AIDS name, we'll, uh, I'll talk about some other viruses as well that are important to us. Okay? So, what is a virus? It's not really a cell. When you think about a bacterial cell, or a plant cell, or an animal cell, but it is encapsulated. So we call it a particle, and these viruses, there's two types, you can have DNA viruses and RNA viruses, so it depends on which one you're looking at. They're typically coated with one or two coats of protein, and they can also have an envelope. As we're going to see during this talk, it's going to be very important for how the virus interacts with other cells, whatever cells that they infect. So that coat is going to come into play when we look at that. They're kind of a gray area when, you, when you're asked, are viruses really alive or not? They don't really respire or make energy on their own or grow. They're what we call an obligate parasite, which means they pretty much, pretty much all of them, function within some sort of other cell. So they cannot be independent, really. They have to, at some point in their life cycle, interact with the cell and make more virions, and then those go on to infect new cells. And the name comes from a poison because it really just infects new cells, kind of takes over those cells, makes new viruses, and those viruses go out and seek more cells. So they just really function or poison all types of cells. So, kind of a gray area. They have, they may have new, uh, you know, an information molecule like DNA, but then they may have some enzymes associated with them. They really don't have what I think is all the other requirements that, that define something as living. So being able to uh, have a metabolism, such, such, such things like that. They're very, very small when you start comparing them to other cells that we look at. So here's a red blood cell, something like 10,000 nanometers. A nanometer is uh, 10 to the minus 9 meters. So, when you get down here, this is a bacterial cell, which is a little bit smaller. You can see the, what the viruses can look like in comparison to a bacteria. So we can barely see bacteria under a light microscope. And you really can't see viruses at all unless you use an electron microscope. So they're really, really tiny components. Here's a smallpox, something like 200 nanometers. Here's the bacteriophages. These infect bacteria. And then the smallest ones, like poliovirus, are barely 30 nanometers. So they're really, really, really small particles, and so as we talk about transmission of these things, there can be a lot of them transferred at one time. So it's not just you're not just getting infected with just one one virus at a time. Here are some common structures. So maybe some of the older folks in the room can remember the little moon lander. It's uh, one of these bacteriophages, which has a very characteristic shape. And again, it has some sort of a coat of protein. So these are really going to be the ones that are going to be interacting with the cell and causing that specificity. 
Same thing with these other ones. So this is an influenza. This thing is the cause of flu. It has some sort of a coat. And we see these little knobbies. These are glycoproteins. Those are going to come into play when they interact with the cells. Same thing over here. Adenoviruses cause the common cold. There's DNA inside of this protein coat. And then the uh, tobacco mosaic virus over here is kind of a cylindrical shape. But they're all kind of similar in the fact that they have a coating. So they are enclosed, and they have some sort of information on the inside, whether it's DNA or RNA, and that's going to allow that information, the life cycle, to continue for the virus. These are all electron micrographs, very, very small pictures. Doing okay so far? Set the stage for this stuff? Yeah. Do they all have glycoproteins? Do they all have glycoproteins? I would want to say yes, because a glycoprotein is just a general term for a protein that's modified with a sugar. I would say 100% of viruses have some sort of protein on the outside. That protein will vary between virus and virus. Okay? So just like our cells, each of our cells have a variety of proteins, glycoproteins on the outside. And those are used to identify cells to each other. Good question. Thank you. Okay, so what do they infect? As I said before, viruses are very specific for what they infect. And really, they can be specific even within an organism. They can be specific for a cell that they infect. So when you look at animal viruses like rabies, polio, mumps, those are going to invariably infect only animals. And within an animal, some of them are going to target specific cells. So we'll see that when we look at things like herpes. They target neurons. HIV targets a very specific cell in the immune system. So we'll see some of that. There are plant viruses. So tobacco mosaic virus is a very, very important one in biotechnology. It's a way to introduce DNA into plants. But there are other ones. Banana streak virus, carrot thin leaf virus, a lot of these are economically important too. They'll destroy crops. So there are bacterial viruses. So like I said, bacteriophages. So even those lowly little bacteria can get attacked by a virus. A phage is what it's really called. And that phage can inject information into the bacteria. And there's a bunch that are important. There are insect viruses. So the deformed wing virus, I think, was associated with that colony collapse disorder. If I'm not mistaken, it was either that or there was some other, uh, some other organism that was attacking the bees and affecting their, their bodies. And of course, computers, right? Computers get viruses, right? So, it's a joke. <laughs> but even those viruses are specific, right? Some are a lot more prevalent in Windows computers than in Windows. Okay. No jokes in this. This is a very serious subject, right? No jokes allowed. Okay, how do they replicate? How do they uh, divide or how do they expand in numbers? So replicate is a fancy word for how do you get more viruses? Maybe I should talk a little this. So there's a couple of cycles that you find in most viruses, life cycle, if you will. There's a lytic and a lysogenic cycle. And it really depends on the virus, which route it would take. This one is looking at a bacterial virus, so a bacterial phage. When it is infected, it will inject the DNA into the bacteria. That DNA, or RNA, can automatically make more virus particles. So in a sense, the bacteria can trick the host machinery. If you've taken a lot of biology. It can trick the host machinery into making more DNA or RNA and the coat proteins that are required. And that will package more viruses, and then at some point they will come out of the cell. So that's what's called lysis. That's where that's, that word lytic comes from. It's kind of meaning to explode or to cut open. So you can make more viruses in this step. Or sometimes they can go through the lysogenic cycles. This is where that DNA or RNA is actually inserted into the host genome to the DNA of the host. In this case, it's bacteria, so it would be DNA. This is typical of some animal cells as well. As well. This is a way that the virus can kind of hide itself, if you will, if 
by basically hiding in the genome and then at some point, either under stress or through some other trigger, they can go into the lysis or the lytic cycle and start making viruses at some point. So viruses can either make new viruses right away or sometimes they can just be inserted in the genome and notice that as the bacterial cell divides, the viral genome divides as well. So that information is still there and it is heritable. So that DNA, that cell can pass down the viral information as it goes on. So two different ways that viruses can act and it really depends on the virus, which one it's going to do. Okay, the chain of infection. Let's talk about that. How do you get infected? Well, there's typically a reservoir, and this is where the virus, and this can also apply to other, other uh, agents like bacteria. There is usually a reservoir where they hang out. So it can be either, either people or mice. I know the uh, recent outbreak of hantavirus. You guys see that in Yosemite? Something, three people died, I think, in August or September. That reservoir is in deer mice. Not always is the reservoir affected by the virus. So deer mice are not affected by the hantavirus being in their system. It's really when it's passed on to somebody else that they can get infected. Or the environment. There are some examples of viruses that can spend a long time out in the environment, outside of their normal hosts or their, or really their environment is the reservoir. But at some point, we have that agent, and it can be transferred through either people. So when you sneeze, right? And we're going to watch this video that I have on YouTube, where I found on YouTube, about passing on viral particles through droplets in the air. When you sneeze, there's, I don't know, trillions of little droplets of yucky stuff that are spread out in the air. And some unfortunate guy or girl can get that. Direct contact, yes, we'll talk about some viruses that can be passed through blood or other bodily fluids. Sometimes you can have a vector, and uh, a lot of the times uh, it can be transferred, like uh, West Nile can be transferred through mosquitoes, even from horses to humans. A vehicle, so you can eat it, or airborne, it doesn't have to be on droplets of water, it could just be on a piece of dust, you can have viral particles. But some way, that agent is going to be transferred through, the, through what are called portals of entry, and there are several different types. There's all of our mucous membranes can be, uh, they, are, they are first line of defense against these things, but sometimes viruses can get through that. Or injection through the skin, so the skin is a very good barrier as long as you don't cut it or poke it with a needle, something like that. So there are various ways that you can get these get these viruses or whatever, whatever uh, agent you're talking about into the body. Okay. I'm sorry for kissing pictures too much. <laughs> okay, so let's talk. I, I found this neat little video online, so I hope you don't, excuse, you don't mind if I show you the video. Any questions on that video? I think it was a very general video. And we'll talk more about the little lock and key mechanism that really determines the specificity of the viruses. So, yes. so the little pink things that were like being the copy machine, they don't recognize that it's a virus? Because I thought they said that they recognize it immediately, but then the little pink things though. The little pink things that were look that were actually copying the DNA? Yeah. Yeah, so those it are just, recognize that it's, yeah, it's just a general, a general machinery that will just copy the DNA no matter what. Oh, okay. So, and typically it's the host machine. So this is the cell's normal DNA polymerase if it's a DNA virus. Or if it's an RNA virus, then we'll talk about this. It has to go through an additional step where there's a, a protein that is provided by the virus that makes a DNA first, and then that DNA can be copied by the host machine. So this, this would not be able to tell the difference between a viral piece of DNA and a chromosomal piece of DNA. Okay. Yeah. Good question. What if it was 
um, put some protein or some viruses or have RNA in them? Yeah. So it's still copy it since it's not DNA. Yeah, and I'll mention that when we talk about retroviruses. Okay. There's an additional step before they make DNA. Okay, let's talk about after infection. So this graph kind of shows you what's called the viral load, so the number of virus particles, in theory, over time after exposure. So let's say you breathe, somebody sneezes right next to you and you breathe it in. There's a lull, basically, an incubation period while those cells can infect. So something like an influenza virus starts to infect your throat cells, those kind of things. At some point, there will be a rise in replication, I'm sorry, rise in viral load through replication. So that's the cell going through the lytic cycle, for example, to make more viral particles, and those go on to infect cells. Usually at some point, though, our immune system will start to recognize these foreign particles. And so you have lots of things running around, T cells, B cells, macrophages, which can recognize foreign proteins. So again, those proteins on the outside of the cell. And hopefully, while you're suffering your symptoms, at the same time, this immune response will start to clear the virus from your serum and destroy cells that are infected that they can find. Okay. For most people, this clearance will be completely done and all that virus will be removed from the body over time. Usually it can be a matter of weeks though. Some flus can stay with you for weeks. But typically it's left up to the immune system to clear that. Now, sometimes there's an inadequate response from the immune system. So some viral infections can be chronic where the viral load and the symptoms don't quite go away even after long periods of time. And a few viruses that do this, a few examples, there's things like hepatitis C, hepatitis B, with hepatitis C, they actually will trick the immune system into thinking that they're gone, and yet you still have chronic infection in the liver, that's the liver cells that they infect, and that can lead to liver cell death and cirrhosis. So sometimes there is just not enough of immune, an immune response to clear all the viruses. Some other things actually produce uh, immunoinvasins, and we'll talk about this later, where they can, again, they produce something that tricks the immune system into thinking they're not there. And then there are some viruses that can go through the lysogenic cycle. So they hide out in the genome, basically. They insert their DNA into the genome and then just hide out. And you never quite get rid of those infections. So some herpes viruses are like that. Yes, ma'am? I heard that mono's like that, but once you have it once, that you always have it? Mono? Yeah, or is that false? Uh, <laughs> You know, you caught me, I don't remember if mono is a viral infection or is it a... Okay. It's kind of embarrassing. That's okay. But uh, mononucleosis, yeah. I, I don't know, I haven't looked into that one. It's kind of like the chicken pox I'm sorry? It's kind of like the chicken pox. It's kind of like, okay, so it's kind of like the chicken pox. I, I don't know. Like I said, I'm not a virologist, so I'm sure there's some virus you can ask me about, I'm not going to know. With West Nile, sure. There, I think there's a, a few people that have chronic infections to that. Most people clear that. I'm not sure as to the regular timing, but maybe there is a, a regular stressor that turns that virus back on. Sure. Questions? You guys are doing good. Let me check. See, the camera's pointed on me, so they don't know who you are. So why is it that once you get chickenpox, you generally don't get it again? Like, just because it... Okay, well, that's getting into uh, the immune system. There is, a, uh, there is a memory associated with the immune system, and I don't, probably don't have enough time to go into that. But you're, uh, when we talk about vaccination, I want to talk about that a little bit. That's one way to help, help safeguard your body and sets up another line of defense. Hello? Hi. Okay, so those are persistent or chronic infections. There is also this term called viral latency, so also as part of the lysogenic cycle. 
Some viruses have the ability, once you're infected, you go through a certain, a, a certain period where the viral load goes up and you get symptoms, but those, the immune system doesn't quite clear all of those, and that viral load can increase at another point. So just like the lysogenic cycle, these viruses are not fully eradicated by the immune system, and this happens with herpes simplex. There's a couple of different herpes viruses. Uh, HSV-2 is the genital warts one, and HSV-1 is the, uh, is the other, um, what do you call it, just um, Cold sores? Sorry, what? Is it cold sores? Yeah, cold sores, thank you. So here, the primary infection is quite large and quite extensive, but these viruses typically, you cannot get rid of them all. And so at later points, you can have reactivation and so that's what, uh, once you get those HSV infections, sometimes you cannot, well, pretty much all the time, you cannot clear all of that. There are some points in the future where those can be reactivated and go through the lysis cycle. So these are cold sores? These particular ones, I think, are cold sores. I just got the pictures off the internet. Okay, so I just have a question, because I get cold sores a lot, and my doctor told me that it was a virus that lays lays dormant in the back of your neck and is released with stress, like, so did I, like, is that hereditary, or? No, probably you had, you got infected at some point, and it can, it can just be through normal contact, and what those HSV viruses, they are specific for neurons, so I think it's neurons in, the, in your neck region, mm -hmm. and so they will insert their DNA genome, basically, into your cells, and that's where they hide out, and then at some point you can you have triggers which can turn them back on and go through the lytic cycle, and that's where you can get the outbreaks. This is termed latency, viral latency, it's where they can uh, you cannot fully eradicate. This is a kind of a dated graph, but I wanted to show that it's probably still true today. This is from 1998, so it's kind of ancient history. Some viruses and viral diseases are major causes of deaths worldwide. And so, not all of these are viruses, but there are uh, pneumonia and influenza that are caused, and they cause uh, respiratory infections. You have AIDS, diarrheal diseases, uh, malaria, measles over here is another one. And a lot of these are major killers of kids, so people under five. I, I went to the uh, WHO website, but they haven't updated, I couldn't find an updated graph of this. But I assume it's still true today. So, measles and things like malaria, they have vaccinations for those, right? Is that why yes. Well, malaria, I don't know. We have, malaria. We have, you have uh, pills you can take. You have drugs you can take. But measles, yes, we have vaccines for that. So, do you know why they haven't been able to? AIDS, yeah, and I'll mention it. I'll talk about vaccinations when we get there. We can talk about why it's so difficult to make an AIDS vaccine. You're just getting a little ahead. I got time. Okay, so let's talk about how viruses do their dirty work. How do they cause disease? There's a couple of different ways I wanted to highlight. Viruses can damage or kill cells outright. So if you think about that video where you have millions of viral particles coming out of the cell that can damage a cell. And for some, like bacteria, they actually, they literally explode and they kill the cell. They induce immunopathology, so that's where your immune system targets a cell that has been infected. And so your own immune system kills those cells off. A lot of plants do this as well. If you look at a plant leaf and you see a little section where it's dying off, plant cells will actually target cells around the infection site, kill them off to try to avoid the spread of the disease. Same thing in humans. And lastly here, we're going to look at, at transforming normal cells into cancer cells. So there are some viruses that can cause this transformation, and that's obviously cancer in the body is, can be a be deadly. Some of the effects can be localized or generalized. So things like warts, you can have just a localized infection, and these typically do not travel throughout the body. You see just the effect at the site of inoculation. So here's a skin one. 
And here you can see kind of the little uh, knobs coming off there. Or you can have a generalized effect. So rotaviruses cause uh, diarrhea, a watery diarrhea. Measles cause, you can see this is a measles patient, and there's kind of a generalized effect throughout the whole body. No, I, I, I tried to get one that was, that was uh, measles. So they, I think with measles, it kind of covers the whole body. You see red raised bumps all over the body, basically. Hemorrhagic fever, these are things that affect the whole body. And really, this cell tropism, so the, the predilection or the bias for viruses to infect different types of cells depends on that lock and key mechanism. So if you saw, kind of got it from the picture. If you have viruses and they have some sort of protein, a glycoprotein or whatever that is coming off, this is the virus particle. It is really the interaction between these cell, these uh, proteins on the coat. So proteins on the coat, and there can be many different types. This really determines how the cell can get into, how the virus particle can get into a host cell. So on the host cell here, whatever it is, that is going to have some sort of lock as they put it in there. So this would be the key. So the lock would be specific for this type of protein. So only the keys that can fit into that particular lock will allow the virus particle to get into the cell. So things like HIV or Epstein-Barr virus, they have particular receptors. So these are the keys, the names of the keys here. And that will, I'm sorry, this is the lock, the receptor on the host side. And only some cells have those particular receptors. So CD4 is the lock on the host cell. The virus particle has a corresponding protein, and they're going to be specific for each other, and that's going to allow that virus to be taken into the cell through that uh, endocytosis. But then there are some that will recognize any number of proteins. So influenza has the ability to be taken up by many cell types because the receptors are quite common when it's found in the host cells. So really, this fancy word is tropism. It's these proteins that are on, on the outside of these viral particles that allow the communication with the cells. If they don't have the right lock, then it'll go on to the next cell and try to get into that one. You guys still doing okay? Okay. Now back to how do they cause disease. So the first example is polio. So polio targets neurons. And so here that virus can actually kill off spinal tissue, spinal cord tissue. So here is a slice from an affected polio patient. And it's the clear areas that are showing cell death and inflammation caused by killing off those neurons. And obviously, if you're going to kill off neurons, you're going to affect the communication through the spinal cord to the extremities, which is why a lot of people are affected and they cannot walk. So it causes paralysis. So viruses can kill off these cells in the midst of infection. They can induce an immune response. So I took this picture from my immunology book. But basically, when a cell gets infected by a virus, they can start creating proteins. Or they can give off other signals that will tell the immune system, hey, I'm in trouble. I've been taken over. I've been tricked. And what these, the immune system will do will send specific cells. So these are going to be uh, not helper T cells, but they're going to be killer T cells, something like that, cytotoxic cells, which will come, they will interact with these cells, and they can actually program those cells to die through a process called apoptosis. So, and here it's just kind of showing it going cell by cell by cell, killing off those cells. As I mentioned earlier, there are some fancy tricks like hepatitis B, and uh, I think there was a herpes virus. They can produce immunoevasins. 
If there is some way to, and it doesn't really apply to this picture, but what immunized basins do very, very simply is, is uh, interfere with this interaction between the infected cell and the immune cell. Because these are just proteins interacting with, the, with each other. If you can interfere or block that binding process, then you will block that cell from being killed off. So then the virus lives and it's able to create more viruses. It's kind of, kind of cool if you, think, if you look at it, how some viruses have figured out how to survive. And this may be why our genome, if you take cell and molecular biology, you learn that our genome, our DNA, contains scads of viral particles, basically viral DNA is a, maybe has been inserted over many years, but kind of uh, gives us the hint that we may have been infected over and over and over again with viruses because we see these ancient copies in our own DNA. Do you have a question? Yeah, are there any theories about uh, the origin of viruses? I mean, they have nucleic acids and proteins, but, you know, yeah, the origin of viruses, I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, we'd have to look that one up, I guess. All right, all right. Yeah, but may I, I don't see them rising just from a cell. Yeah, that was it's what I was thinking. It's question. like a splinter of a cell or something, yeah. I don't know. When we talk about uh, some other viruses like HIV, there are some theories that they've come from other viruses, like simian viruses immunodeficiency virus, but where did that one come from? Right? Yeah. It's a good question. Anybody have any ideas? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry? It's always existed. Yeah, I know. It's a good question. Sometimes we're not able to answer those questions. Very frustrating to scientists. Okay, here's the third cause, or the third way that viruses affect cells. And these aren't all inclusive, but three of the major ones. So sometimes when a virus inserts its DNA into a host cell, it can cause a transformation from a normal cell to a cancerous cell. And basically, the most basic level, most cancerous cells have no control over their own replication. So you get a great many divisions of cells under no regulation, basically. It's called an oncogenic virus. Anytime you see that word onco, the prefix onco, means pertaining to tumors. Pertaining to tumors. So oncogene is something that is associated with causing tumors. Proto-oncogene. Here's an oncogenic virus. So when the virus infects a cell, it messes up its own regulation and that cell can start to divide. Lots of many, lots of examples. There are liver cancers, cervical cancers, certain leukemias that are all associated with this, which are not inherited, but once they get infected by a virus, then you can have now a predisposition for getting cancer, certain cancers. I wanted to include a little bit of a tangent, because there was a book I read a few years ago called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. I don't know if you guys ever saw this. And the reason why I'm interested in this is because it's a story, if you're interested in science and personal stories, this is a good one, easy read. The story of a woman, Henrietta Lacks, who she was infected numerous times with human papillomavirus, which causes cervical cancer. And when she went into the doctors, they took some of her cervical cancer cells, and at the time, this was in the mid-50s, you didn't need somebody's permission to do that. They took it and they found these cells grew very, very rapidly and very robustly in the lab, which was not true of most cells at the time. They came to be known as HeLa cells, in HeLa cells, that's for Henrietta Lacks, they are probably the most important cell type in medical research right now. They're used by everybody. People have made billions of dollars off of these cells, and yet nobody really remembers the lowly beginnings of these HeLa cells. But this is an example where her cervical cells were transformed into cancerous cells because she was infected by these papillomavirus particles over and over and over again. And that probably has some some reason why they're so prolific. They're so prolific that they will actually contaminate other cell cultures in the lab. So you have to be very, very careful when you use them. Sorry for the tangent, but I thought it was an interesting connection between our story and medical science. 
So look at the lower life of Henry the left. It's probably here in the lower. Okay, how are we doing? I'm going to move on to treatment. Any questions on infection or transmission or how they cause disease? That was very general. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you said there's different modes of like the transmission, but is there like a most popular one? Like is direct transmission more? That's a great question. So is there a most popular transmission? It really depends on the virus. So things like HIV don't survive well outside the body. So they don't spend a long time in the environment. Where other viruses can, so I can remember, I think it's West Nile. No, it's one of the viruses we're going to talk about that survives quite easily in the environment. But then again, some things like hepatitis C, you typically don't pass that on through kissing. It's, it's got to really be through blood. And so it kind of depends on the virus. So whether, I, I can't tell if there's one popular one. But uh, anything where you're like doing uh, drugs or something like that, where you're puncturing the skin, is a really common way to share uh, serum, basically. And so if you have anything in there, that's going to easily transfer serum. So there are some modes that are easier than others. Yeah, good question. So um, the viruses, the, the type of virus, um, the symptoms of that virus being present in your, present in your body are... Uh, determined by what cells they're attacking, or so that's where it comes from? Yeah, so the symptoms come from what cells they're attacking, yeah. Okay. So with AIDS, it's going to affect the immune system, mm -hmm. or with HIV. With uh, hepatitis C, it's going to affect the liver, so you get different uh, pathologies, right? Okay. Yeah. With influenza, we get, what, aches, muscles? pains, sniffles, <laughs> and a lot of that's the innate response from your, your immune system, trying to fight it off. Yeah, mucus always running out of your, all your mucus membranes, right? It's kind of gross, but that's your first line of defense against these. Okay, so treatment. As you said before, since viruses aren't really living, we can't really target them in the same way as that we can target other organisms like bacterial infection. <laughs> Typically, when you have a bacterial infection, you're going to be treated, treated with antibiotics, Something that's going to affect bacterial growth, so they can't multiply. But viruses, since they depend on cells already, you kind of have to target the, your own cell in order to shut those guys down, which is not usually not a good idea to try to kill off all your cells to do that. This is why it's so frustrating. A lot of people want antibiotics when they go into the doctor with viral infections, but really antibiotics are going to be ineffective against these, these infections. And it's also why typically they say go home, get rest, drink lots of fluids, because really what they're saying is let the immune system do, do its job. So that's why it's, there's really no instant cure for a lot of these things. There are some antiviral remedies like uh, Tamiflu, and there's another one on the market. These things can interfere with viral replication, but you have to take them within a certain amount of time. 48 hours of infection, and really they're just going to decrease the severity of the symptoms. It's not going to rid your body of all the viral particles or stop that replication completely. So, can you use like yogurt that have viral culture in them? Do anything that helps with viruses like colds and? Yeah, eating yogurt. Uh, I think that what you're probably referring to are like diarrheal diseases. So when you have diarrhea, really what your body is doing is uh, just emptying your colon. And so the idea is to take probiotics to try to reintroduce the natural bacteria that are in your colon. It's infected. Helps not get colds. Well, yeah, because there's the what, emergency and those kind of things. Those those types of drugs are not proven, and they're not. And they always have that FDA warning on there that says these statements have never been uh, proven completely. So I can't really speak to the efficacy of those treatments, although I still do the same thing. When I get on an airplane, I take that airborne, which is spikes your body with vitamins in the hope that that helps your immune system. <laughs> but it's, it, those haven't been proven. Yogurt? Now, yeah, yogurt, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about yogurt. Uh, my understanding of yogurt is 
it doesn't really block viral viruses, but I thought it had something to do with uh, helping your natural biota. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that's the only thing it's going to help with, but that's my understanding of what it is. Does anybody else know anything about that? Because those, those cultures in there, like lactobacillus and, and other compounds, those aren't going to actively destroy viruses or anything. So they're not going to have a direct... Okay, and lastly, the other treatment we want, want to spend a little bit of time talking about are vaccines. So vaccines are ways to help get your body ready to fight off different viral infections before you get them. So I'm going to spend some time talking about vaccines and what it does in some of the background there. The, the word vaccine comes from uh, vacus, which means it's Latin for cow. So I don't know if you guys know the story of Edward Jenner. He actually used cowpox and injected that into kids and it didn't cause cowpox because that only affects cows, so we can see how specific they are. But what it did do is it allowed an immune response to smallpox, which was killing a lot of kids at that time. And I think this was, oh darn, was it the late 1700s or the 1800s? I have to go back and look at it. But the purpose of a vaccination is basically to use some form of inactivated pathogen. So in this case, we're talking about viruses to try to stimulate a primary immune response without causing disease the first time. So you inject something into the body to help the immune system learn what this thing, what this foreign object looks like. And then the next time that you are exposed to that, the hope is that your immune system will have a memory for that, that infection and be able to fight it off without you getting sick at all. Really. So it's going to establish an immune memory. So the second time you're infected, you're going to get a much quicker response, a much more robust response in immune cells. And those immune cells are going to be specific for whatever pathogen you have. It's really the basic idea of a vaccination. It's to expose you to something like measles, mumps, rubella, or measles, or I said measles, something else. Uh, what are the new ones? Papillomavirus? There's a new papillomavirus that's out. And there's a whole bunch that, that uh, kids get nowadays. But the idea is that you, a polio has one, right? You try to protect your body from reinfection with that same pathogen. So you don't get polio or whooping cough or something like that the second time that you get it. Now I know there's, we can spend some time talking about vaccination because there's some, there's some uh, debate, I guess you could call it. One thing I wanted to point out though, so a lot of people nowadays are choosing not to vaccinate their, their children. And this really stems from studies in the late 90s, early 200s, 2000s. Uh, I think it was Andrew, Andrew Wakefield over in the UK published a couple of uh, reports linking the MMR vaccine, so measles, mumps, rubella, to autism. Unfortunately, just a few years ago, it's been found that, that uh, really, he did not do good science, and it borders on fraudulent science that he, he uh, published this linkage. And really, there have been a bunch of other studies that have not linked those two with autism. And, and uh, it was specifically with the mercury preservatives that were found in vaccines. We can talk a little bit about this, but the problem is, and it still leads to many people not getting vaccinations for their kids. And I'm not here telling you whether it's right or wrong. I'm just going to give you some facts about it, and you guys can make your own decision. But we just had a, a presentation for rural health scholars from the Department of Public Health. And actually, um, Wakefield was, uh, let's see, he can't practice medicine anywhere anymore. He's been yeah, stripped of his title, and he's had to put back the United States, or well, uh, first world countries like 30 years in research because of how fraudulent yeah. it, it is quite unfortunate and a lot of parents nowadays are are refusing vaccinations I know there was an outbreak was back in 2005 in Indiana where they had an outbreak of measles in the US and what we forget if you think back to that figure I showed you things like measles still kill so 
Uh, one thing I want to mention is this idea of herd immunity or community immunity. The nice thing about vaccination is that if most people choose to be vaccinated, then it actually performs or provides a measure of protection to those who are, don't choose to be vaccinated. So if you have a bunch of people, so this is my herd, and I'm not an artist, I'm a biologist. So here's my stick figures. And they've all been vaccinated against whatever. And you only have one person, so here in green is the green light for viruses, come get me. Because I don't have any immunity, basically. The people that have been vaccinated, so in black here, so these guys have been vaccinated. They provide a measure of protection for these people who do not get vaccinated. And that's because you basically decrease the chances that this green person will come into contact with another green person that has also not been vaccinated. The problem is, and I think this led to the Indiana outbreak because it was a bunch of kindergartners. So that's typically when you start getting vaccines. You have a class of kindergartners where maybe, I don't, I don't know how many kids it was, most kids have not been vaccinated now. And so maybe one out of five were. But really, here, we no longer have what's called a herd immunity or a community immunity. All it would take for an outbreak here is one person to be infected, and they will easily spread that infection, especially in the kindergarten class or something like that, where you can easily spread that to other green guys, whereas here, maybe there's less chance that if this guy gets sick, if he comes in contact with these guys, they're not going to be as effective because they're going to have some form of immunity to that. Whereas here, the more green guys you have, the more outbreak, more chance for an outbreak. So, one thing to keep in mind when you start having kids and not having them vaccinated, I still think personally, this is my opinion, I would rather not have my kids get polio, measles, and whooping cough, and so I've chosen that all my kids are immunized completely. Now, does that mean it's 100% safe? I, I don't know. They've definitively proven that there's no side effects from that, but that's my argument. So take it for what it's worth. So, that's where me. would the people's virus come from in the middle of Indiana? Well, there are reservoirs, right? There are places, there are people, there are places where measles can hide out, and then. Maybe like somebody Sure, somebody comes from another country. You have an exchange student. Somebody comes in here and gets infected. Now all of a sudden, 25 out of 30 kids have measles. And really, it should be kind of surprising. Measles is, is not that widespread anymore. Same thing with smallpox. We're starting to see recurrence. There are polio outbreaks now in the US where it was thought that these were eradicated. So while Andrew Wakefield certainly has had, had his uh, effect on the community, I think that I think there's a strong case for vaccinating people to try to uh, avoid these kind of really nasty uh, infections. Do we want to spend any time on there? There's a lot of debate on there. And again, I'm not trying to convince you one way or the other. Just I'm trying to give you information. Autism is definitely yeah better than polio. Well. <laughs> Yeah, the spectrum disorders, there's a wide range of them, but certainly I'll take a live kid over a dead kid. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and we can talk about it afterwards as well. But I thought, I think this is an, an interesting concept when we talk about vaccines. That's what else we're going to talk about. So here's a bunch of different vaccines that are available now, and it includes bacterial diseases as well. So uh, what were we talking about earlier? Anonucleosis. Yes. Is there a vaccine for mono? I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, there is yellow fever, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, paracella, chickenpox, influenza. There are ones for hepatitis A and B now, rotavirus, papillomavirus, rabies. Those kind of things. If you want to get rabies, I'd rather get a vaccine. A lot of these viruses, different ways you can do it. So some of these are inactivated viruses, so like the influenza virus. And I'll get to you in a second, I'm sorry. I'm not being rude. Uh, inactivated viruses, you kill the virus and then inject that into the body. And so the body can still have an immune response to the proteins that are on that viral capsule. You can have attenuated viruses. 
That's where you have modified the virus somehow, so it's no longer as virulent than it was as before. And that, uh, that's kind of the form that Edward Jenner did. It's a natural attenuation or a species restriction, where you can use a related virus, inject that into the body, and the immune response will be cover a wide range of viruses. And then there are some that are subunit vaccines. So these are actually for toxins that are produced by the virus. So you can take that protein, make lots of it, and then use that as a, as a vaccine itself. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask which, which vaccines are required for when you're sending your kids in. Because aren't there vaccines well, required? Well, I think there are some. This is the current immunization schedule, but I don't think it's, I don't know in the state of Utah if it's required. I think you can still bow out with parental permission. In fact, I think there are some states that require it for entrance into kindergarten, but I don't know if Utah is one. Deb, do you know? Anything about your business? I, I don't know, because again, I chose to have all my kids. You can yeah. actually opt out. Like, a lot of my friends that were homeschooled or things like that, where they went into school in like 10th grade, they didn't have to do it. Their parents just signed a thing saying, if my kid gets this, we'll notify the school. So you just opt out. You just say, yeah. Oh, here you go. Yeah, you can opt out. And so I don't think it's required. But this is kind of the schedule, and this is a few years old, it might be a little bit different now. But the new ones they're pushing are the papillomavirus and the meningococcus. Those will come later in life. Uh, I get my influenza one every year because I know you guys' immune systems are shot, so that protects me and my kids, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm picking on many other ones over here. Um, some parents say I'd rather have my child get it naturally and that builds a stronger immune system and I'm not quite sure what the difference would be between getting it naturally and getting the vaccine since the immune system is responding to pretty much the same thing. So there's some, there's some scientific question as to whether it's better to get chicken pox the regular way. I know I got chicken pox the regular way as a kid because they didn't even have the vaccine. With the influenza um, immunization, is our body just in need of a reminder every year, or is it a new strain that they're immuni immunizing against every year? Yeah, it's mainly that the influenza virus can mutate okay. rapidly. And so your immune system, while it may be able to recognize older versions of that, so there are typically new viral particles that come about that the immune system will not respond, will not look but that memory should be longer than a year, so we should get okay. some coverage after all. Because I know like with my hepatitis, I'm, I'm immune and I don't have to ever get the shot again. Okay. You yeah. know, with a lot of them, that's the way it is. Yeah, we built, yeah your body has built up that memory. So you have okay. kind of this pool of B cells that will recognize foreign particles. Okay, let's get into some of the uh, viruses here of interest. I'm just going to go through a few. Yeah, I just had a really quick question. Is it mutation that causes Chickenpox to be latent, and then sometimes present later in life in shingles. Is it mutations? I don't know if it's directly mutations. That may just be the the, uh, the action of the virus. So if it goes through that lytic cycle or the lysogenic cycle, right off the bat, that could be due to mutations because it could prevent one or the other, yeah. and then you get that some kind of a trigger. Okay, first one up is West Nile. So this has been in the news this month. It's been the worst year for Texas. There's something like 43 people dead from West Nile this year. You don't, you don't think that uh, that's scary. So this is a picture of it here. It's a flavivirus. So flavus in Latin means yellow. So it's from the same family as yellow fever, dengue fever. Dengue, like you said? Dengue. Dengue? Thanks. So it's flavus, the flavivirus, basically, is in that same family. And this one is spread through mosquito bites. There's different reservoirs. Uh, even some animals, like horses, can be affected. So it's killing some horses in, in Texas as well. Most of the time, this acts just like a regular flu. So most people don't even get symptoms. 34% get some sort of a fever that can last for a few weeks, and then it's gone, just like using, a, just like a regular flu. And then there's a few that get the neuroinvasive disease, where it gets into your spinal column and can kill you if not treated properly. And so there are antivirals that you can try to use against these. So it's West Nile. I mean, we were 
We have to worry about it around here, too. And in California, I had to worry about it as well when I was out there. So Something that still affects people and still kills people. There was SARS. Anybody remember this? You guys were maybe a, half your age at this point, but nine years ago. This was a great example of how quickly a viral outbreak can be spread worldwide. So there, this was spread through travelers on airplanes, and it was actually quite scary how easily this was spread. So SARS is what it's called, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, the coronavirus. That's in the same family as the adenoviruses that cause normal uh, common colds. And that outbreak, there was 8,000 cases and over 900 deaths worldwide. And just like a common cold, reinfection is very common. So that means you could reinfect yourself over and over again. So it was really hard to get rid of it once you had that. And you typically had a lot of respiratory problems. But this one was quite scary. A lot of people thought they were scared of how quickly this spread. Well, just keep in mind, there are some reservoirs out there still for SARS. We don't know where they are or when it will come back, but it's going to at some point. So again, I'm just kind of giving you, this is just a few of the things that I thought were interesting, or things that have been in the, in the news lately. So you guys remember bird flu? Even earlier, right? Avian influenza. So this was linked to other influenza viruses as well. And it occurred in 1997, when it was first, the first humans were infected. They classified it as this H5N1. That referred to the types of proteins that were on the outside of the virus, so those protein coats. Okay. Really, really scary. I mean, most of the people that got it, over 60% died after they got avian influenza. And uh, this one, here's a good example. I mean, you remember talking about where, I think, when, how they, how they infect people? Well, this is one of those examples of something that can stay in the environment for long periods of time. And so they can stay on a piece of dust or something, theoretically, and just wait until they come to a new host. So, uh, <clears throat> there, are, there are a bunch of other you know, influenza viruses that are different. I think Hansa virus is the best one. You guys doing okay stuff? I'm just kind of clicking through. This one's even uh, really scary, Ebola. Yeah, there are some really nasty ones out here. Makes this really cool filamentous structure. My understanding is that these are individual virions or particles that are in them. So it makes a shepherd's hook, is what they call it. Called a filovirus because of that, because it makes those filamentous structures. There are about five known Ebola viruses, and I looked up online. The last outbreak was in Uganda, and with Fatality rates above 50%, and they're really looking at bats. So this one hangs out in bats and waits and waits and waits, right, until it hits a new host. These are really, really scary because these hemorrhagic fevers basically cause you to bleed out from every pore in your body, and so it kills you quite rapidly. There are a couple of books on these that are very scary. So, huh, makes me shiver to think about it. Okay, and then last but not least, HIV. So I'm not, this was in no particular order, but since this is uh, kind of with AIDS awareness, we should talk about this virus as well. So HIV is the human immunodeficiency of virus, found in 81, so it's been around for quite a while now, 30 years. It's a lentivirus. So the lentiviral family is associated with diseases that are long-term, and they have long incubation periods. So. We're not talking flu for two weeks, we're talking years. This virus causes AIDS, which is the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Basically a progressive failure or a stepwise failure of your immune system. And this is caused because HIV targets one particular or one or a few particular cells in your immune system, the helper T cells. So as it kills off the helper T cells, your immune response goes down. This is what's known as a retrovirus. So if you don't know what the dogma of biology is, and you should, because you should all take biology. So, you guys know? Hmm? Dogma of biology, anybody? OK, you'll learn it in your gen bio class. And it means that DNA goes to RNA and goes to protein. So if you learn about cells and how we make new cells and how we make proteins, this is the typical route. With retroviruses, they have an RNA genome. So
So they have to go through a process called uh, reverse transcription. Reverse transcription. And this is true of any retrovirus, any virus that has RNA in it. And some of the viruses that I mentioned were RNA viruses. They have to go through an additional step. So this one, this is a lot of science content, so beware. Here is the virus coming in, so it's binding to a particular cell. And with HIV, it sends in its RNA genome. So it's a, just an RNA and a couple of proteins called reverse transcriptase and integrase, which are not normally found in a cell. And these are required for the RNA genome of HIV to insert or integrate itself into the nuclear genome of the helper T cell in this case. So this is a, this is a retrovirus going through reverse transcription where it inserts its genome. Once it does that now, right, it's inherited. So any cells that come from these cells will contain the HIV genome. And it basically takes over the host cells of the host machinery and makes new viral particles out of here. Okay? So just like we saw in the video, where except that this step here, the virus integrates its genome into the cell. So it kind of fakes out the cell and uses its own machinery to make to do its dirty work. So with HIV, this is a this is a, a graph of the typical course of infection. On one side, you have your T cell count. So it's a CD4 cell. Your T cell count, that's in blue. And then on the other side, you have the RNA copies per mill of plasma. We're going to talk about what happens over time. So initially, you have the primary infection. You have a high level of T cells, and obviously a low level of RNA from that virus. And just in a matter of weeks, you get a rapid, rapid decline in the T cell. So as the HIV cell enters the T cell, it will destroy that T cell by making more virus, and those virus cells will go out and infect more T cells. You do get a little bit of immune response right here. So anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, so week 9 to week 12, you get a little bit of an immune response. When your immune system recognizes that increase, so this increase here, of viral RNA, and so it starts to combat that RNA, that rise in virus. But it's kind of a uh, continuous battle. Here, this, this term clinical latency, don't confuse it with like uh, herpes, which goes into silence mode. HIV, sorry basically continues to increase itself over a really, really long incubation period. It's a matter of years. So we're talking 10 years or more. And you can take drugs for this, and the drug regimen is really bad for HIV. You take multiple pills at multiple times per day, but all they're doing is trying to slow this replication, this viral replication. And at the same time, as the body is trying to fight this off, your T cell count really just starts to drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. Until at some point, and some scientists think this has to do with the body's ability to make new T cells, at some point we just run out of the ability to make new T cells. And at that point, when you kill off all of your T cells, you really become open up to opportunistic diseases, which really is what most people that have AIDS succumb to. They succumb to some sort of fungal disease or cancer or something that the body would normally be able to fight off, and in this case, they do not. So, with any kind of a lentivirus, you get this kind of slow progression or a slow progression of disease, and at some point, uh, the body's just no longer able to contain it, and you're going to die from that. Any questions on this graph? Okay, so, yes? Um. Steroids? Yeah. What is that about? Well, a steroid is basically an anti-inflammatory. So maybe it's trying to treat something that's some cause disease that you're having at the same time. But most of the drugs that you're taking are going to be antiviral therapies. Something trying to interfere. So uh, interferons, things like that, interfere with repli uh, viral replication. There are transcriptase inhibitors to try to inhibit this process of going from RNA to DNA. 
just have a few more minutes. Let me finish up and I leave some time for questions. Current treatments, I just said, so you take lots of time, lots of pills over the rest of your life. So if you're rich, but the distinction is people in Africa have no money to buy those antiviral medicines or dead quite rapidly because they have no way to slow down that process. Other people have, have a, a love your time. Problems with HIV. So why can't we get a vaccine for it? It's kind of like the influenza virus. The HIV virus has a high genetic variability and a high mutation rate. Which means that even the day of infection, you can already make new, many new variants of the HIV virus right away. So any vaccine that you're going to make is really only going to target one variant at most. And it's those other variants that are going to be able to divide just fine and kill off more T cells. And interestingly enough, you take HIV out of late stage victims of AIDS, they are much more virulent, much more dangerous than the typical HIV strains that you find out in the wild or uh, uh, whatever possible reservoir that you have. So that means they can just continue to compound many, many mutations on it. So with something like influenza, we can continue to take new vaccines to try to cover that, and that doesn't always help because we still get the flu, right? Something like AIDS is even more of a uh, moving target. So I hope I gave you kind of a, an overview of some of these, and I hope that you guys would go out and find more information for yourselves and answer those questions. We have a few minutes. I think there's a class that's supposed to be coming in after this, but if you want to ask some questions now, it's great. Or after, we can go out in the hall and ask anything. Deb, did I do a good job for you?